So we're going to do our post-secondary education system uh, hearings, uh, the agency budgets, and we're going to start out with uh, Dr. Scott with PSU. Is he here or is he on the web? Okay. Aye, sir. You ready, Mr. Chair? Yes. Thanks, thanks for allowing me to testify this way. Uh, I ended up at the Regents meeting yesterday and raced home last night, tried to beat the storm and ended up, we had about, I don't know, half inch to an inch of sleet, ice, mush, slush, and all kinds of things. So uh, we uh, kept the campus open. Not all of our students are happy about that, but we feel like when they pay tuition, we need to deliver. And so uh, I don't know if you know this or not, but sometimes parents even call us still in higher education, so quite a deal. Anyway, I've, it is my uh, pleasure to speak to you today. Uh, some of you know this is this will be my last time to speak to this group. I'm retiring as of June 30 of 2022. So I've been at Pittsburgh State University for 34 years. I've been in education for 48 years from the middle school level to junior college to the university and taught everything from middle school of math to graduate statistics and education programs. So uh, 13 years as president, and that's probably double the national average. So I, when I say that around my colleagues and the new K-State president, I think it makes them nervous, but it, it is just a fact. It's a very complicated role. It is an awesome role. And I've led my alma mater, which it just doesn't get any better than that. We hear about coaches going back and coaching their alma mater, and it's just a neat thing they get to do. Well, it's certainly a, it's an honor of my life to serve Kansas in this way and to serve Pittsburgh State University in this way. So uh, uh, I'm as excited about the prospects and the future of Pitt State today as I was in 2009 when I took this role. I would remind you I started in the Great Recession and I'm going to wrap things up in a global pandemic. So other than that, it's been pretty smooth sailing. So what I thought I'd do, I, I, you've got a hand out there, kind of a leave behind that we've shared with you, a colorful document. I thought I'd just use that to pretty quickly go through a few things and then, and then see what kinds of questions that you have uh, as well. So I won't take a long time. But across the top of that, you see three pictures, and, and really those three pictures speak to our mission. And our mission is to provide transformational experiences for our students and our community. And, and you can look at a lot of mission statements across the country of universities and colleges, and they'll be a half page long or a page long, and they try to touch every subgroup and every aspect of what they do. And we just decide we're going to simplify this. We're going to be about transforming our students and transforming our community. If it doesn't fit in those two buckets, we don't do it. But that allows us to do some things that are really pretty special for Pittsburgh, for this region, and, and for the state. The picture on the left shows somebody going to work. And we are very, very successful with the Kansas Technology Center and our other programs that involve so much applied learning that our kids walk across the stage and they go to work. Uh, that's, that's a person there that's, I believe, is working for Crossland. And Crossland's an amazing supporter of ours, Crossland Construction. Uh, they also hire our graduates on a regular basis. A number of years ago, Ivan Crossland, Ivan Sr., who's a graduate of Pittsburgh State, uh, he spoke to the legislative bus tour that came through. And uh, he likes to say this way. He says, you know, I've built a lot of buildings on the Pitt State campus. I've tried five or six buildings he's, his company has built for us. And uh, he said, you know, I like to do that, but if I never build another building at Pittsburgh State University, it'll be okay because what I get out of Pittsburgh State University is gold. And when he then further explained what gold meant was our graduates from our construction program. And that's an amazing endorsement of the work we're doing and the transformational opportunities our students get. On the far right is kind of an interesting picture. Uh, a few years ago, or 40 some years, I believe, the farm show was on in the county, was in Crawford County. And uh, they made some noises a couple of years ago about leaving. And, um, and so we said, we had a faculty member who said, why don't we offer to host the farm show? And we got busy and worked with the leaders of the farm show. Uh, and we now host it on our campus. And we've done it a couple of years. Uh, this year we had some rain, of course, always have rain. But we've got 154,000 square foot under uh, air conditioning, under roof in our outdoor or indoor track. And uh, tracked about 8,000 people to that event over a three day period. And all the setup and all the vendors. 
and uh, we have no ag programs. We don't even have an ag program, but we thought it was so important to do this for the community that we stepped up and got it done. So I think that's really an important point. Uh, this Sunday, we'll have a Broadway show in town. A few weeks ago, we had Peyton Manning in town to give a speech. We've had Laura Bush here. We've had uh, Condoleezza Rice here on our stage, really trying to help our community have the kinds of amenities that people want that would attract people to this region. You know, we're the only county in Southeast Kansas that's grown over the last census. Uh, Pittsburgh State University has something to do with that. I just don't think there's any doubt about that. So across that middle there, Pitt State in 2022, you'll have about 6,000 students. That's a 15% decrease in, since 2008. That's something that's really happening across America <clears throat> right now. Uh, of course, following the Great Recession, we had record enrollments year after year after year. And we got up to 7,400 students at one point in time and really have come back in the other direction. This, fact, this past fall, we had an increase in our freshman student body, and we're very encouraged by that because if you can increase that freshman group and retain them, you've got a good future ahead of you. Uh, I am very old-fashioned in the way I operate, and my predecessor was as well. He was, Dr. Bryant would say, we're not going to spend more money than we take in. And that's how we've done things. So as we lost enrollment, we reduced our staff considerably. And you see that we've reduced our staff by 16%. We've taken 140 positions out of this, out of this place. Uh, in the uh, education hearing or ed the uh, Senate Education Committee hearing recently, uh, Senator Baumgartner kind of uh, got after Cindy Lane a little bit about the fact that the current president of Pittsburgh State University had taken 50 tenure lines out of uh, Pittsburgh State University. I kind of thought that was a higher number we went back and looked at it, and it's pretty accurate. It's something that the faculty aren't very happy about at times, but anybody involved in management ought to understand. We're reducing our costs, increasing our flexibility, and managing the institution in a very appropriate way and financially responsible way. So it's not something you want to do, but when you don't have the funds, you've got to make those decisions, and we're willing to make those hard decisions. Uh, Pittsburgh State University is very fortunate. We'll raise anywhere from nine to 10, $12 million a year. We have amazing level of support in this region. And most all of that support, uh, that private support is local, I would say. Just a terrific group of donors who support us. And then finally, on the, as you go across, we've been very successful in the grant space. Some of that would be the HERP and the GEAR money. We provide some information to you on that, but also some really aggressive uh, grant writing and nursing and with our Polymer Center. And then people often ask, what are your top programs at Pitt State? Well, you look across that next group, nursing, construction, uh, pre-med. If you've got a child, a relative, a niece, nephew, a neighbor, wants to go to become a doctor, and wants to go to the University of Kansas, I'd argue there's not a better place to get a pre-med degree than at Pittsburgh State University. And of course, for many, many years, we've, we've been a teacher's college, and we've got a strong teacher education program. The biggest problem there, of course, is the pipeline has really shrunk. The number of people interested in going and teaching is very, has, has declined, continues to decline. I'm very concerned about that. And then, of course, we have a very active uh, business uh, department. And at the bottom, you know, we would argue, I would argue I'm a Kansan. I grew up in Kansas. I grew up in Baxter Springs. I went to school at Pittsburgh State University. What we want to do is we want to do something that's good for Kansas. Uh, over 50% of our graduates stay in Kansas. Average starting salary now is above $50,000. If you're in IT and information systems in some of those areas, you're going to be at 60 and above, which is just amazing. And we continue to work with the Kansas Small Business Development Center. We have a very active unit on campus that we've moved downtown, actually, that really does a lot with capital investments and guiding that within Southeast Kansas. So on the next page, I'm not going to go over all this, but in the next page, because I want to talk specifically about a couple of things and see what your questions are. But, but the, the regents, I think, did a really neat job under the leadership of, of President Flanders of building a strategic plan that should be relevant to Kansas. He said, let's focus on what's good for families, let's focus on what's good for businesses, and let's focus on economic prosperity. And, and so within those columns, we try to just lay out just a few key things, although many, many more things are going on, but just some key outcomes that we feel like we're achieving uh, in those, in those three, under those three pillars. Uh, one example would be, you know, when you think about tuition has increased, and we have, that's, that's a part of my legacy I'm not very proud of. We've had to raise tuition because we wanted to maintain 
the excellence and the quality of, of, of the programming. But at the same time, we've raised a lot of money to provide scholarships for students. So one way to mitigate those tuition increases is to go out and raise more scholarship money. We've probably gone from a million and a half dollars to well over $3 million in just private money. Then we use other funds as well through grants, uh, through our own uh, revenues to also discount tuition, <clears throat> much like you would hear uh, private institutions have done. Under the business area, I would, I would remind you that the Kansas Technology Center really has a, a very special place to provide the kind of talent that the key wits of the world, Cowan Gordon, Cross and Construction, Hutton and Construction, that they need or Coke needs for um, accountants, marketing individuals, and so on. One of the things we're most proud of when you go out to the Kansas Technology Center and you think, how does that curriculum get developed? How does it get revised? How do you make sure it stays up to date? And you're going to hear from the technical colleges in a minute. You're going to hear they stay on top of things very carefully. They've got to be relevant. We have to be relevant like that in the Kansas Technology Center. And we do that through advisory councils. And our advisory councils are very, and I'd use the word aggressive, in terms of telling us what does the industry need. I think next week we've got uh, a large group of people coming in. I believe Automotive is next week, Automotive Advisory Council. We've got a Wood Technology Advisory Council is coming up. The Construction Advisory Council is one of the most active that there is. A number of years ago, the Construction Advisory Council told us our, kid, our graduates need to know some Spanish. We went to the Spanish department and we said, we need to develop a course on Spanish for the workplace. Well, you know what the Spanish department said? We can't do that. Well, guess what? We did it. We figured it out. We figured it out and we responded to what business needed. And that's been a good program and a good addition to that program. So and then the last thing I'd mentioned just over under the uh, pillar three in terms of the pillars is um, I mentioned the Small Business Development Center. We moved all of those employees downtown to our Block 20 operation, where we bought four buildings or we're leasing four buildings downtown that have been completely remodeled with housing upstairs and retail space downstairs. And we've injected our small business development people into the center of commerce in Pittsburgh, Kansas. And it really has created a revitalization of downtown. So you can say, you could say to me, I thought you guys were about graduating people. Well, we are. We're about credentialing people. We're about putting them to work. We're about getting them into med school and being successful. We are about those things. But as I said to begin with, we're also about changing this community, growing this community, economic prosperity, and our downtown operation has done that. I'm really proud of that. So the, the final two things at the bottom of the page are incredibly important. The one on the right, and, uh, and Chair Billinger and I have had some conversations about this. In fact, both of them. But deferred maintenance is a huge issue. Uh, Pittsburgh State University, I believe we've done a nice job of, of keeping our buildings updated. We have amazing uh, private support to help us get that done. But we can't do it by ourselves to get it where it really needs to be. And so the governor's recommendation is out there of adding $25 million. I think there's some other thoughts about what else we could do to augment that. And what I would ask you to think about is something that's longer term than one year. We didn't get here in a year. We can't get out of this in a year. And I would commit to you, this place has always been a good steward <clears throat> of these monies. We put it to, to use in a very appropriate and efficient way. And we don't do gold-plated anything. We do things that you'd walk in and you think, that looks good. That looks right. That's the kind of, that's the kind of facility we want to have. So deferred maintenance is a big, big deal for us. And I'd ask your consideration on that. And, and to me, and I'll say this, even more importantly is the, the employee compensation side. We are losing employees like we've never lost employees before. And we just lost someone out of purchasing who's a grad of ours who came here. And we thought just a couple of years ago, we thought we'll have him until he retires. He's gone. Uh, we had an accountant. We thought we'd have her forever. She had been out, worked other places, came back to us. She's gone. We are losing individuals in nursing as the nursing faculty. Very, very difficult to hire. We lost a construction professor recently, went out and started building houses, probably tripled or quadrupled his salary we could pay. So you're gonna hear this from every agency, I know that, but this is the, I think it's the singular most, it's the most important issue we face because we cannot have excellence if we don't have the right talent. And, and I know whatever gets done won't affect my salary because I'm not gonna get a salary as of July 1st. 
I won't be making the budget decisions as you go into July, into July, but I just know for the future of Pittsburgh State University, this is a huge deal. I'd also remind you that the governor put in a 5% increase, but that's only on state general funded positions. So that means we would find all the other dollars. In other words, she's gonna send a raise of two and a half percent and we'd have to figure out the other two and a half, which if everything gets approved that the governor recommended, which I'm guessing will not happen, but if, if everything she recommended was approved, we would still, Pittsburgh State University, cut $2 million from our budget next year. I mean, that just tells you where, where we are. Uh, lots of challenges, lots of opportunities, and in the middle of all of it, some really good things have happened, which I'm very, very proud of. So that's a, that's a real quick look at $110 million budget and a 6,000 student, 800 employee operation uh, that I've been honored to lead. So I'll be glad to answer any questions, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Dr. Scott. Questions? Senator Fagg. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Deferred maintenance, what kind of number are you looking at on something like that? Our, I think our total is in the $80 million range. What, okay. what is, what's challenging on that is, is that is really getting it to a pretty high level of condition. You know, it's not, you know, are you going to get every building to that? Do we need to get every building to that? I'm not sure. But that's kind of that top dollar. And right now we get about uh, $3 million a year from the Education Building Fund. And that's what we utilize. And then a good example, though, would be the nursing building. We're going to build a simulation hospital on it and also renovate most of the building. So, and we're going to use all private money. It's an $8 million project. We have a $2 million gap, but I asked someone for $2 million the other day, and she said she just wanted to know how long it would we could lay a pledge out for, four years or five years. So I think we're going to get $8 million of private money to do that, and much of that's deferred maintenance. So we have, we're having private individuals help us with the deferred maintenance as well. And I think that's an important point. Other questions? Senator Alley. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for being here today. Even though it is by WebEx, we appreciate uh, appreciate you being here. Uh, the student population going down, is that from, uh, where do you draw your students from? And I am a former grill, so or, I don't think you can be former. I so, but no, uh, no, once a grill, always a grill. That's correct. <laughs> but uh, where do you draw your population from for these students? Are they uh, in the area? Are we losing students uh, to, other universities outside of the area? Well, first of all, as I mentioned earlier, the, the enrollment pressures are across the board, except for the large research institutions. They've kind of held their own and the prestigious, the Harvards and the Yales, all those, they, they've kind of held their own. But state regional institutions across the country have really take, taken the brunt of the enrollment loss. I mean, it's just, it, it, it's a fact. Uh, right now, what's a huge challenge is just the, the job market. So if you're 17 years old in the last couple of years and you're exiting high school and you can really go drive a truck for 20, you know, $20 an hour, that's pretty appealing rather than delay gratification for a $60,000 job by going to college for four years. Now, remember the last recession, the unemployment rate for non-college was double what it was for college graduates. So, so the recession kind of is, is pretty tough on those individuals without credentials. So what we've done, Senator, is we, and this is historically we've done this over time. We live, gosh, seven miles from Missouri, 30 miles from Oklahoma. So we are in the corner. And uh, years and years ago, my predecessor went to the legislature and to the regents and asked for permission to allow in-state tuition into the first county into Oklahoma and the first county into Missouri. And we call that the contiguous counties. And there were 11 of them. And then a few years later, we went back, we got two counties deep and then three counties deep. And then we went to all of Arkansas, Oklahoma, and Missouri as in-state. Basically just moved the, the state line. And more recently, the reasons have allowed us to expand to 31 states throughout the country as in-state. Now, the, the purpose of that is to take programs like our plastics program or automotive or wood technology, those unique programs, and 
and market those as strategic areas. We'll have a dozen students out of, out of Phoenix, believe it or not, that study wood technology because we've got a pipeline from there. And that's what we want to build because those students will they'll stay in the area. And if we can attract them from away and then they stay, that's good for Kansas. So we've been very aggressive on building that out-of-state approach that really makes them an in-state tuition rates. We've given up some tuition to do that, but we think long-term university is going to be in, in better financial position by doing so. So lots of factors are influencing enrollments right now, but uh, but we, we're, we're not satisfied with where it is. We're going to, we have a growth mentality, but it's a challenging environment to do it in. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Seeing none, uh, Dr. Scott, I, I personally want to thank you for your friendship and uh, your hospitality when I've been to Pittsburgh State several times. Uh, you, you, you did a really, really, really good job down there, and uh, we're, uh, we're going to miss you. Hopefully, uh, we'll get a good replacement, and, and Pittsburgh State will continue. Uh, I, I, I like it when, when a guy gets in there like you and says, you know, we don't have the money. We've got to just like any other business, we got to make adjustments, and you you did that, and and you've kept uh, Pittsburgh State uh, in good solid uh, footing by doing that. So thank you. I appreciate that very much. Thank you. It's been an honor. Thank you. Okay, next we will have the interim president Ken Hush from ESU. Welcome to committee, Ken. Please turn the uh, the mic on. There's a button on there, so. Appreciate it. Good morning, everyone, Chair, Committee. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you. Um, it's an honor. Um, yes, I am the interim. Um, the week before Thanksgiving is when I started. So um, the, uh, I'm fortunate. Um, I'm, um, I've had the opportunity, Dr. Scott has just uh, spoken, and, and he said some great words earlier. Uh, at the previous session we were in, I'd like to thank Dr. Scott in front of everybody again as, as someone who has, he has welcomed me and frankly with my quick learning curve that was needed uh, in a lot of areas, he's been incredibly helpful as with the Brothers and Sisters University. So um, yes, I'm um, the interim, I am from, I'm not academia and by the way, um, I like it that I have the experts in academia and, and we can gel with all of our ideas uh, together to make the whole system better. I'm from the private sector, um, I, uh, from the business world. Uh, that said, I grew up in Emporia, and uh, I went to Emporia Stakes. I had a couple businesses that uh, I worked two jobs, and they were going to work around my school hours uh, as I worked, and then I had a, a tennis scholarship as well, so I was fortunate to stay there. Um, um, I've helped out with the alumni in various forms over the last few decades. Uh, I chose after my retirement and uh, to kind of call the Emporia area home base again. I still have family there and my dad's around and brother. Uh, so um, I had the, the opportunity 45 years ago about because I was a, a student at Emporia State University my last year in school. By the way, that was year five for me. So, uh, but anyways, I had an opportunity to my last year to meet a company on an on-campus interview. And they were a small company, and they were, uh, I thought they were uh, you know, fantastic even at that time. But the university gave me the opportunity. I did join them in, in the business sector. Um, they were, again, small. I, I had the luxury of growing with them over the years. To, and they're currently one of the, the largest uh, companies, certainly in Kansas, in the nation, and you could suggest uh, in the world. I learned a lot, but it was all because of the opportunity that previous taxpayers and previous legislators funded Emporia State University to give me that chance. And so I want to thank all those prior, what you were doing today, and all those in the future. I believe you have just a, a short packet that we've presented to you. Um, because of time and not to be too repetitive on, on Dr. Scott previously. Um, being from the business world, we look at expense, and that's what Emporia State is and all universities, as an expense. 
key part of the expenses to make sure they're good ones. And hence, good expenses are investments for the future. We, we adopted the tagline the university did a couple years ago on, on investing in the future via our students. You have provided um, about $35 million a year to Emporia State University. Uh, that represents about one third of our total budget. And so every $1 that uh, you provide us and the state and taxpayers, uh, we leverage it with two others. Uh, we appreciate the, the uh, current governor's recommendations on, on increased um, higher ed support. Certainly we need that. Uh, and again, from an investment standpoint in the future. Page two, high level. We're about 6,000 students. And by the way, 40 years ago when I finished up, it was about 6,000 students as well. Um, it's, it's roughly 1% over the last uh, less than 1% um, decline. So it's been fairly steady. Um, because of perhaps logistics uh, and being very centralized, Kansas, um, you know, nearly 90% of our students are from Kansas. Um, ironically, when they graduate, um, 85 to 90% the last few years stay in Kansas. And again, the advantage we have is, is from a regional perspective and our location. If you look at Emporia State alumni over time, about 70% of all of our alumni have always stayed in Kansas. What does that mean? Economic prosperity. That whole machine generated by higher ed and all forms of education just keeps going and going. We have a high re, uh, placement percentage of our students and one of the last things is, um, you know, we are one of the lowest debt uh, schools in the state and, and share that with Pittsburgh State. Yep, sure, you could say we're the cheapest. No, that's not the case. Um, I think in Kansas, I'm very proud of our work ethic, uh, and I, I attribute to a lot of that because the majority of our students work while they're going to school. Next page, what do we do well? In poor state, I, I, you know, I grew up with parents who always were talking about higher ed, okay? And although a lot of the family uh, did not have that opportunity, I did. And so, you know, I listen to and I, I look at, and by the way, growing up all these years, and also from the outside, from a business perspective and hiring standpoint, I look at all the regent universities in Kansas and, and then what the Board of Regents currently does, and, and Blake Flanders, by providing different types of point of views going forward today. And it, it's, it's generating a lot of new thinking and, and embedding all at the same time expectations. Okay. Again, stepping back, wearing a taxpayer hat. I wanted those. Okay, that's what we demand. And obviously in your roles, you, you want to make sure the dollars for the state of Kansas are being spent in a correct investment manner. What do we do? We have, we have you have the innovation, the, the research and development larger universities in Kansas, those three, as we all know, those university presidents do a phenomenal job, as do uh, uh, Fort Hayes and Pittsburgh State. We are regional with them. Um, what we do well is we are health services, we are nursing, and we provide pre-med, but we're strong, strong in nursing. Teachers, strong on teachers, always have been. We were the original teaching school in Kansas, right? And been doing it 159 years. By the way, both those areas, mentioning workforce, the demand is so great, we're in trouble, okay, as a state. So, and try, what do we do to get ahead of all that? The third one is business, accounting, finance. We've all known and worked with some of the, the, uh, the, the best leaders in business and successful. Um, and then the fifth piece is our sciences, uh, technology, and IT. That's our strike zone, okay? Step for a moment and just think what we just went through as a society, certainly as a state. These, these areas were the backbone of getting us through, right? Teaching, they had to adapt. You know, we expect our children to, to, uh, to still learn regardless of the age. By the way, we want them learning, 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 so that in the future, 
that it is investing and repaying back Kansas in various forms. Nursing, same thing. Who was administering all the help during the pandemic? Okay, strike zone there. Business had to adapt. Had to adapt. They had to, to apply some magic concepts and juggling of finances, etc. And what all? What group made all those three kind of happen? Well, everybody, a lot of people went remote. They went home. Okay, it looks different today. The workforce and where it's at. Technology helped connect it all. How we support Kansas, page five. You know, we have about a thousand employees all in. Uh, you know, although in Lyon County is where Emporia State University is located, you know, 86% are non Lyon County members, so it's not just a local feeder. I'd like to just go, and by the way, for the 35 million that the state allocates us, Putting the business hat on, you could look at success and how it's measured. And by the way, I was always raised to to uh, think about, you know, the the future and and what may play out, what are the repercussions of decisions, whether they're not so good or the good ones. And so always look forward. That's the the career environment I was in. Uh, frankly, the private sector analyzes things. They look at things. They run data. They look at forecasts, trends. The different factor is they could take action, and they take action quickly, what makes sense. And, you know, um, that kind of segues into where we are at Emporia State University. We've talked about, and it's been mentioned by several institutions over the last eight, ten years, that various cuts have been applied not only to the system but to Emporia State University. Yes. Um, our university teams have made the best they can with some of those small cuts. Here we are today, it's snowballed, okay? And what we have recognized is, and it's the last page, I'll hit on just a couple things. We're here to tell you today, in applying Kansas humility, is that uh, good is not good enough. We need to do better as a university. Um, you know, Winston Churchill was probably, in my mind, one of the, the last century's leader that had to, uh, to face uh, different things, uh, global things, with his back against the wall. All of us went through various things with our backs against the wall the last couple of years. What it has pointed out to us is change is coming the last couple of years. And by the way, it's here whether we want it or not. Yep, we can mitigate it here, we can maybe help and, and delay it here, but, but it's here. The takeaway is, again, what our, our partners, the Kansas Board of Regents, are doing is saying it's okay to analyze all these things and take some action. That's what we're doing. We're probably different than any other university. We're blowing the whistle on ourselves. Um, we've gone through a couple months of analytical period um, in, in every area, okay? Uh, we've kind of realized that, I think like everybody these days, that maybe we cannot do everything for everyone any longer. And what does that mean? Don't know, but we're, we're analyzing it step by step. Churchill said, to improve is to change. The second part of that, he said, is to be perfect, you need to change a lot, okay? We're never going to be perfect. No one is. But what it also encourages us to do is it's a continuous improvement process. The decisions even we made yesterday. We look back when I wake up tomorrow and think, huh, I wonder if that was the right one. Okay, so it is a constant challenge process that we're doing with ourselves. We have to do this. State taxpayers and you are ex expecting that. Our local communities are expecting that. The students are changing. Student mentalities change. In fact, I would argue they've changed just in the last 24 months on the beginning of COVID and where they are today. Who knows? There's no magic answers to all this, but it's taught us we need to adapt. What are we doing? We're reimagining Emporia State. Okay? 
Our, our overall organization was very vertical. It had several layers, okay? And so all the way down, and what it also had was all of our decision making were various buckets and silos. So we've removed all that. We're establishing just a leadership team. We are putting together across campus and including front and center, the faculty deans, which have never really been represented face to face individually other than via the provost. We have 22 people on that. We're talking about challenges. We're talking about what potential changes. We are soliciting everybody's input, not just in that 22, but the entire campus. By the way, the other changes that are occurring are our community. There's new faces in our community with our commissioner, with our mayor. It's exciting. We've got new, new faces that on the university side that we have elevated. By the way, the priorities increased enrollment uh, initiative. And also, you know, from the, um, from the facilities and, and asset management portion of the campus, we're looking at that. Um, you asked earlier, um, you know, our deferred maintenance is, is around 80 million as well. Okay. Short term needs are around 25, 30 million. Um, total asset value of the campus is around 40, 400 million, just FYI. We're looking at that. In fact, uh, hey, a decision was made about eight years ago to, to tear down the building and, and never was done. So, I mean, that's an example of decisions have to be not only made, discussed, analyzed, but they have to also be carried out. Otherwise, they're just a waste on dollars from a go forward basis. We have a huge need. Our, our nursing program, which is huge, which the state of Kansas needs it. By the way, two areas of burnout, you've all been noticing, right? Going through the whole pandemic episode. Nurses, okay, and teachers, big areas. Not only are we short as a state for those, you know, we're gonna get shorter. And we ought to be planning on that, all of us in our various roles. Um, the investment side, for the 35 million you give us and you apply it towards 6,000 students and you assume it's a four year degree, you make various conservative assumptions. It's a payback to the state in seven years. It's roughly a 10% return on investment. Yep, return on investment is only just one way to look at it. It's a good investment. By the way, Dow Jones historical investment since time is 10%. We pr there's probably arguments, fairly easy, that that seven year payback with what just went through pandemic and the needs and, and incremental costs that it cost everybody, probably was a quicker payback. So the step back is we made some elevation. We made some, a couple personnel changes. We are optimizing stepping back and optimizing our platform. Yep. Our faculty, they do a great job in continuously preparing, educating, and graduating students. At the same time, that has to go on a step back and look, how are we set up as an organization and making the changes and tough decisions so that we are preparing you know, for the future. We, all, both those have to go on. We have to create a point in view as Emporia State, working with our community, working with the state, KBOR, all of it. We, Emporia State, um, are no longer going to dance around the edges, you know, with these, with these small things. And we are going to reinvest, okay? We may not do this thing as well. And by the way, the demand isn't there any longer maybe for that, okay? But what we are going to do is reinvest in the areas that are successful and what the state of Kansas need, okay? Again, that's our strike zone areas that mentioned previously. I mentioned relationships with, with all parties. Um, we as Emporia State, whether it's our students, our community, our alums have all of a sudden been re-energized re with some of the potentials and some of the things. And so there's a percentage of that populations that have come out of the woodwork that they haven't been actively engaged in in the past, and we're trying to, uh, to, to listen to all that. It's exciting. Um, Dr. Scott, again, the mentioned leadership. Um, I've learned a lot. And by the way, I was always taught, because if you're not learning uh, something every day, you're not improving. So 
But uh, he mentioned that this is probably one of the toughest jobs, being a university leader. Absolutely. I actually have something to compare it to. It's different. But boy, you bring in, particularly for a regional institution like Emporia State University, you, you bring some, some acumen that is, is a compliment, and, and uh, we can move it forward. Again, there are changes. There are, we face challenges, and we'll do them together. And again, thank you for listening today. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Ken. Uh, questions? Senator Alley. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I noticed you say you about uh, 2,800 new teacher graduates in the last five years, uh, which is about over 500 new teachers a year into that pipeline. Hopefully most of them stay in Kansas, and I think you're showing that most of them do. And how, do, how many teachers retire a year or leave the profession? That's a great question. Uh, I don't know. Let, may I get back to you on that? That's a great question. Because not only are you retiring, but then you're also having burnout, and so it's, it's maybe. And so we do the same thing with our nursing. And you mentioned you have a nursing. Do we know? I don't. I missed if it is in here the amount of nurses you graduate a year uh, every year but but that's the same issue there how many are how many are we supplying and then how many are 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 we losing one of the uh things that we're seeing all over is our healthcare uh staff are going more more to the um mobile nurses the uh contract nurses contract employees and uh that seems to be a problem all over because they're there three weeks and then they're gone somewhere else or so that that seems to be a problem uh we need to grow our homegrown and keep them here in Kansas if we can those are great may i comment yes those are great comments absolutely and uh you know it's interesting even health or hospital systems such as employers they're losing even their own nurses to the traveling nurses and, and by the way by the way that compensation's out of whack. They're moving for multiples. So what are we asking ourselves? What are we learning? By the way, you mentioned, Dr. Scott referenced earlier and the others, teachers are leaving for a lot of other opportunities. It's a no-brainer. I mean, if that's what they want to do, and again, this is where I, I would just, you know what's exciting through all of this is we've probably never been, certainly, faced anything like this. Okay, got it. Yep, it wasn't easy. On the other hand, it may be the biggest and largest opportunity that we have to redial, recharge, reinvest. I, I would probably be here first today. We ask ourselves, you know, and, and we're asking for some things on nursing. We've got to move a building that's off campus that was shared with the hospital. We've got to move it somewhere. Uh, there's a chance to increase nursing at the same time. We've got to apply some economics to that and see if it makes sense from an overall state perspective and university, it's an opportunity. And if we don't react as a state, and reminder, the private sector is acting all the time. They're pulling people out, our good people. So that's one of the initiatives. We're going through a whole compensation analysis from our side. And for people who are, are nuts and bolts and grinders and high performers and, and are key, we have to uh, we have to do something about that. We can't. We at least have to understand what we're faced against. So, thank you, uh, Senator Fag. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for your presentation, Mr. President. My uh, question kind of comes in the same area of Senator Alley, except I'm over on the mental health professionals. We have a shortage now. Projected growth of 23 percent. How many people is Emporia State kicking out to help with that type thing? Graduates, are we increasing, decreasing? You probably don't have that, but I'd be interested in those numbers. Certainly we will get that to you. Your reference to kicking out, just so I'm... I'm talking about graduating, ready to, right. ready to go to the workforce. Okay. Thank you. Um, I guess I just have one question, and, and we're kind of running short on time here, so... Sir. Uh, and I, I failed to ask Dr. Scott, but how many buildings do you have that would qualify for demolition? Um, 
I would call it high priority, probably two and a half. <laughs> Three. Any, any idea on what the cost might be to, to demo those two and a half? Yes, uh, we've got one. Again, I mentioned it earlier. Uh, at, at, it was actually a decision made eight, nine years ago. Uh, that's probably a two million. Uh, there's sensitivities around that, obviously, with what it's used for today versus what it looks like for others in the future. Uh, we've got uh, a dormant dorm um, that's probably in the six million type of range, and some miscellaneous other things for probably ten million. So about okay. ten, ten our, total. Yeah, our our total deferred maintenance is is eighty. Uh, priority twenty five to thirty, and probably on the on the raising side in that area. Now, stepping back and mentioning this nursing opportunity, and and the hospital has given us notice that. They, they would like to have that property back. We're considering bringing that back on campus in one of these facilities, renovating. That ought to be an investment type of opportunity. And, and we, we were in the process of changing the uh, sale of property at the universities to going back to the universities and no longer going to CAPER, so that might help you in that deal. Thank you. So, well, thank you a lot for being here, and I think all three of us coming from the business world appreciate your uh, your. your different look at uh, the university more from a business standpoint. I, I think that'll be very helpful for you and the University of Emporia State. So thank you. Thanks so much. You bet. Next we'll have uh, Dr. Julia Ann uh, Mazek, Mazek? Mazacek, sorry. Vice President of Academ uh, Academic Affairs at Washburn University. Welcome to the committee, uh, Dr. Uh, yes. Mazacek. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to present on behalf of Washburn University. I will tell you, I'm the chief academic officer. I've been a part of Washburn University from a faculty member and in administration for about 20 years. Uh, so I've been there 30 years. And so I hope I can answer most of your questions today. But if not, I'm sure I will be able to get your answers. And I know that Dr. Farley, I want to send his regards. He would have very much liked to have been here. Uh, he enjoys so much uh, presenting to the committees and talking with you about Washburn University. So, thank you. S send send him our best and, uh, and, and welcome. Well, I hope you feel welcome here today. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to say uh, many similar things to what uh, President Scott and what uh, President Hush said. Uh, but I'm we're, Washburn University, I'm going to tell you a little bit about our mission just as a reminder because uh, it should put all of my other comments into, into context. And we are, the, we are a four-year public regional institution. We have that comprehensive regional mission. We're a teaching institution. We are the only open access four-year public institution in the state, meaning that if you graduate from a high school in Kansas, we have a place for you in our hallways or online, wherever it might be that the student wants to be. And we are committed wholeheartedly to helping you find a pathway to the graduation stage and doing whatever we can to wrap our services around you and whatever needs you might have to be able to get there. And we have students that have a high, high a need for services, and we have students who don't need any services. So it creates a diversity of um, all options that we have to have on the table to, to best serve. We primarily serve the Shawnee County area and Northeast Kansas. Most of our students come from those areas. Uh, over half of our students come from those areas. And we also, uh, just a reminder that a number of years ago, it's been about 13 years ago, we affiliated. And now under our umbrella of Washburn University, we have Washburn Tech, which exists here in Topeka, Kansas also. And it is where we do most all of our technical education. We've moved most, we used to do some at the university, and we've moved all of it into our technical school. And they work very um, seamlessly with Washburn University to provide pathways for students. And I, I heard something uh, President Muma said today that I really liked. We talk about certificates to uh, doctorates, and, and I liked his um, uh, GED to doctorates. We also have the largest GED AOK -OK program in the state. Uh, so we, we serve a broad set of students, and we're very proud of that heritage and uh, expect that we will continue with that mission for, for the, forever, actually. Um, 
I, we, we, the, the three things that I'll, I'll couch my comments in today are, are the three items that we all talk about, and that is really, really talking about access and student success, talking about building our talent pipeline so that we have the best workforce for the future, and then addressing economic prosperity across our state. And uh, I would like to first explain a little bit about how we're funded. Just to put it in context, we, we look different than the other institutions that you that receive operating grants. We, we actually have a three-legged stool of revenue streams that support Washburn University. We're very grateful and thankful for the support that we get from the state. Uh, the state provides through their operating grant approximately $12.5 million to us each year. And the governor has proposed an increase in that, of which we, have, of course, are fully supportive of and, and know how we will use that, which I'll talk about in a few minutes. Um, but that, that represents about 13% of our budget. And then we also, have, we also receive a sales tax. We have, a, we have a, a sales tax that happens in Shawnee County that supports us, and that is another 25% of our budget. And the majority of our budget is made up by tuition for our revenue budget. And so we're very conscious about tuition and recognize that when we have any cuts or changes in those other two sources, it, it, there's no way that it can't affect our students and what, and what that costs. So I will tell you at Washburn Tech, that looks a little different because the, the monies that are provided to Washburn Tech through CTE Excel funding it's about 59% of their budget. And so it's very significant, and, um, and we are very thankful for that change that happened many years ago with Senate Bill 155 originally, and what a difference it's made for our community, and how many students are able to take advantage of technical education. So I, I would wanna talk just a little bit about um, how we do our budget, because because if I were in your shoes, I would want to be thinking about what do you do with our money? How do you make sure that it's invested well? And, and I just want to share that we are going through a similar process that President Hush just explained. And that is we're, we're basically taking everything we've done. We're going through a time of tremendous change, which gives us tremendous opportunity to really look at what we're doing. Are we doing it well? Are there ways to improve? And we're analyzing. We're, we're changing de decision-making processes. Uh, we're, we're actually looking to see if there are ways that we can improve with every decision. And so the way that we decide to uh, explore whether we replace a decision is, is very um, thorough. And, and determining what our future demand looks like. What does it look like today? Is there, do we have efficiencies inside the department? That is not, those aren't fun things to do necessarily, but they're important so that, we, so that you know that we're spending, spending the taxpayers' dollars very, very well. And, and we will continue to do that as, as we build our, our organizations for the future and make sure that they can um, withstand and be ready and stable during the, the future and the challenges that we, we actually yet have. Uh, I will say during COVID, and we received a good number of grants from, from the state, and we used those funds in ways that, that primarily uh, affected our students through direct student aid, and we were able to issue block grants uh, at various times during, during this last uh, 18 months to support them and to help them offset their tuition payments and their, their costs of books and all of the things that are required. Um, the rest, uh, the, the next majority, we, we spent about 10% of the monies to make sure that our learning environment was as good as it could possibly be. I will tell you those monies made it possible for us to continue uh, the education for our students and to be able to make sure that they were able to make progress in their educational journey and to graduate. That's always our, that's always our goal, is, is making sure that our students cross that uh, graduation stage. The MOE funds that are just now coming, we are using those almost exclusively uh, for recruitment and to, to build the foundation for recruiting our future student bodies, whether they be high school students, transfer students, or adult students. Uh, our, as I mentioned before, our primary role is to educate citizens and to prepare our talent pipeline for the workforce here in, uh, in the state of Kansas and in our community. And I would tell you we regularly conduct economic impact studies 
And those studies show us that um, as recently as two years ago, that the taxpayer's rate of return on their investment in Washburn University is, is about 9%. And for our uh, investment in tech, it's about 8%. Uh, of course, our students have a much higher percentage return on their investment, but um, uh, because they actually get to earn income on the other side. Um, but that is a, a, a strong investment. I, I would like to have an investment return of 9% on an annual basis, uh, on an ongoing way. And, and then finally, I want to talk mostly uh, about the, the work that we're most proud of is the work that our faculty and staff have been doing to enhance student success. Because in the end, the way that I started was to make sure we believe that the best way to ensure that our students are successful and that we are able to create the talent pipeline and that we do have economic prosperity is to graduate our students. And we know that what that means is that we have to reimagine and rethink ways that we've done things in the past and ensure that what we're doing in the future meets their needs and, are, and they're able to be successful. And so I would like to talk about we've been, we've been reimagining, revamping our curriculum. Uh, we've been talking about how we deliver courses in the best way, how we advise, how we coach, Actually, even as down to how we communicate with students and when and, and how we even write those statements so that they can hear them. And through these efforts in the last four years, we've raised our graduation rates by 20 percentage points uh, for our, our four-year graduation rate. Our six-year graduation rate is now over 51 percent. And I, I would just bring to, to mind that we're an open access institution. That's a, that's a, that's a phenomenal um, uh, response and, and graduation rates. Additionally, we are, we are great partners. We think that that's one of our core uh, competencies and, and brings great advantage to our communities. We, are, we partner with our K-12 through um, districts in, in our area. We are the largest CEP provider of any four-year institution in the state. Uh, we serve approximately six high schools, um, and through a relationship, we, we serve uh, we serve almost 800 students a year uh, in our CEP programs, uh, it, which allows them to get college credit for uh, half the price so they can leave their high school with, with um, credits underneath their belt, ready to, um, ready to go to a four, two-year, four-year, or technical school with, with, um, with some work already completed. And then I would say that Tech, uh, tech works with approximately 25 high schools in Northeast Kansas and provides education for just over 700 students uh, for technical, technical programs. And some of those graduate with certificates or are able to actually even go on to an associate's degree before they graduate. And one area that I uh, am really proud of, we're just in the beginning stages of this, uh, we are working with the Kansas Department of Corrections and we are provide and our local uh, correctional facilities and we are providing pathways of education for uh, correctional uh, residents of correctional facilities. We have been inside the Topeka Correctional Facility now for about 18 months. And uh, Second Chance Pell is actually what made that possible. And so we are educating right now about 37 students um, there. Uh, Washburn Tech is just starting a program uh, in the fall. And they will be offering something on site so that um, at Topeka Correctional Facility for technical training so that when residents are ready to leave the correctional facility that they will have marketable skills and ability to do um, work and, and specific jobs when they, when, they are, um, when they are out. So we're very excited about that and we're, we're proud to be a partner. We're the batch. We're the bachelor's degree partner for the state of Kansas, so we can provide that pathway uh, no matter where you, no matter where you um, uh, reside in the state. And so I would, I would just finish with a few things. I, I wanted to uh, respond uh, about what we consider to be our top programs and, and what we do so well at, and I know some of that is in, in some of the documents that we've given you, but we, by, we are primarily uh, our, our largest set of majors is related to health care, whether it be allied health, whether it be um, um, the, the caring, the caring uh, professions such as social work and human services, nursing. Uh, 
we, we graduate that there are approximately 40 percent of our graduates a year are, are from our nursing or from our health care programs and health related programs we do have a psych mental health nurse practitioner program and i just wanted to um, respond to that because we realize that there's such a shortage in the state of kansas actually in the whole nation and in mental health professions Nurse practitioners have a high desire to get that specialization so that they can serve the mental health needs of their patients. And so we've created an online, fully online, working professional degree program. We serve right now about, about 100 students from across the nation to be able to get their certification in psych mental health and, and be able to provide those services to their patients. That program is actually in a mode of transition because we have more demand than we can serve right now. So we're reworking our curriculum and determining how we can serve more students than we're serving right now. So um, then I would say we, we uh, it would be our sciences, and uh, we serve uh, our hard sciences are very strong, and many of our students um, go on to be doctors and to be other other healthcare professionals go on to doctorate degrees. And um, and then our business business um, and applied applied professions that would be the, the three the three strongest areas on our on our campus. Now all of that rooted, of course, in a very strong liberal arts foundation. So it was an honor to present today. So thank you. Thank you, Doctor Mazacek. Um, questions, Senator Alley. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for being here today. Uh, reading through your document as we were listening to you, uh, one of the things that struck me was the fact that, uh, well, for instance, in your academics, you're challenging the students to get through in four years. Mm -hmm. uh, and you had an increase, I think, about 20% by, by doing that. And that's just by, t by encouraging the students to do that. And then we find that uh, on your math courses, and uh, you say, let's make sure they pass the appropriate math course for what they're looking for. And you've seen an increase of 30%. And so I think that's a, a compliment to your uh, counseling department, uh, the counseling the students to be in the right course at the right time. Uh, I also note, noted that you are um, you know, accepting general education or elective uh, credits. Uh, I think that's, that's important, but bringing those from the high schools and bringing those in so they can get a certificate uh, with that, with your uh, used to be Senate Bill 155 program. So mm -hmm. we do appreciate uh, that type of activity. Uh, most of your students stay in Kansas. I thought you said. Most, most of our students do stay in Kansas. About about ninety percent of our students are from Kansas. We, we, we sound similar to the other regionals. About ninety percent are from Kansas, and about ninety percent of them stay. About seventy percent of all of our alumni base still is in Kansas. Yes. And then the last one I, uh, that I thought was interesting was uh, about the was it the rule. A law program uh, where you're taking uh, the students in that law program and sending them to rural Kansas to practice uh, and hopefully they'll stay in the rural Kansas yes yes we have a we have a wonderful grant that helps us do that through the Hanson Foundation and uh, that that allows us uh, students in their third year of law school can be placed in an extern and then they can complete their third year of law school while they're in rural Kansas in an externship. And, um, and uh, we call that the Third Year Anywhere program, which is pretty in, in, uh, inventive also. Thank you very much. Senator Fagg. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for your presentation. Uh, my question is going to be kind of in the area of you've had COVID money up to this point. As we go forward and the COVID money gets shut off in here sometime, you see any big challenges to that? There's been a lot of money, and just uh, wondered if you'd want to try to comment on that a little bit. That's such a great question. I, I would tell you that we were very careful at Washburn uh, that we were using those monies for one-time types of things that would not rely on having to be con 
having continuing money. Uh, so so I, I mentioned that almost half of the money went to student aid. We won't be able to do that, of course, without without the COVID without the COVID funds. And uh, but but most everything is something that we made a one time investment in, and then we will have to determine. For instance, technology. We don't think that we'll ever be able to go backwards in technology. We we upgraded so that we could deliver remotely, and uh, we'll have to determine in, in our in our normal capital budgeting process how we are going to um, maintain those. But but really, we were very careful about making sure that we did not um, spend those monies for for things that we did not have budget continuing budget to support. Any other questions? Um, I guess I'd ask you the same question. Do you know as far as buildings that need demolition? Do you know how many you have and what the cost might be? So I will tell you that, unfortunately, we do not get any funds from the state for any of our buildings. So I understand. Okay, I'm just okay. curious of where you stood as far as your deferred maintenance and, and We are in the process. Uh, we don't have as much deferred maintenance. Uh, uh, we've, been, we've been very careful about that over, over time. And we, have a, we do have a very small dedicated fund that we use to maintain. It doesn't get us to the, the level of, um, of learning experience that we need without private funds or without debt. But we, um, we, we are probably not in exactly the same place on deferred maintenance, so I can't tell you that number. But I will tell you we're in the process of evaluating our buildings on campus, how many that we need, and um, um, how to best utilize them. We do believe that we have at least two buildings that um, could be raised. Do an, any idea what the? It was not as much might be. as what I, I, I heard President Hush say. I think it's right around uh, under a million dollars. Under a million, OK. Well, thank you a lot for being here. Send our best to Dr. Farley and, and tell him we said you did a really, really good job. Oh, oh well, <laughs> OK. Thank you. Next, we'll have uh, Heather Morgan with the community colleges. Welcome, committee, Heather. Thank you very much. Um, you've been hearing from people who only had to cover one school. Now I get the opportunity to try to cover 19, so I will um, do my best. On the first page, which is actually page two of the testimony, I included a table that illustrates the uh, Fall preliminary enrollment for our community colleges, you can see that the one year change is about a 4.5% increase. We had the pandemic dip last year and then enrollment is going up. Um, specifically, we are seeing, if you notice Dodd City Community College, they've made a lot of efforts to expand their technical education programs and some programs that are directly connected to the high school and some FAFSA completion in initiatives so that getting more of the Hispanic population enrolled. Seward, Dodge, and Garden are all Hispanic serving institutions. The majority of their students are, are from the Hispanic community. I will say also that this headcount does not include the amount of customized training that we're doing directly for employers. Johnson County does more customized training than they do um, than they have headcount enrollment. So there's a huge segment of our business that you don't see counted in our enrollments that we do direct training for businesses. They may not need a certificate. They, the business might just want them trained in a specific program area. Um, and that's something that we do. We know that uh, at a few of our community colleges would be involved in the um, large project if we land that, and that'll be, again, training directly with that, that company. Moving on to the next slide, slide three. Um, if you look at this slide, I included it uh, related to the first uh, table on the upper left. That is the headcount at the state universities. So in 2021, there were 106,000 students served. The table to the right or, um, is how many of those students were undergraduate and graduate students. So of the 106,000 students uh, served at the state university, 76,000 of those were undergraduates. The next table on the lower left is how many uh, students we serve at the community colleges. We serve 95,000 undergraduate students. So we actually served more undergraduate students from a headcount perspective at the community colleges than were served at all the state universities. The technical colleges are, are shown there on the right. They served about 15,000 undergraduate students. Total uh, students were served as, at the undergraduate level was about 188,000 students. Sometimes I think that that's an important number 
to kind of keep in mind how many Kansans are involved in the higher ed system, and that doesn't include Washburn or the private institutions. Moving on to the next slide. Uh, Kansas Community Colleges serve 82% of our students are part-time. So our students are working and learning or dealing with family circumstances, so only 18% of our students are full-time students. However, about 82% of our students are Kansas residents. We have about 17% of our students who are out of state. Tremendous number of our students are going to stay in the region that they are being educated in and are currently working in the Kansas workforce. You can see the table at the bottom of this sheet, uh, the number of certificates, short-term certificates, certificates, and associates degrees that were awarded. And again, this does not include any of the customized training or badges that um, might have been earned. Moving on to the next slide, I put, this is the first, the top of the page is the demographics of our Kansas Community College students by age. So the blue line is, would be our high school students, so about 9% of the people we're serving are high school students. 32% of the people we're serving are between the ages of 18 and 19. And about 35% of our students are between the ages of 20 and 24. Our students are generally a little older when they come to us. Um, and, and again, are, are working part-time. The technical colleges are down below. You can see that, that their students tend to be a little bit younger. If you turn to the next page, I wanted to highlight the, our, the success of our transfer students. You can see by institution the GPA of our students that are transferring to the four-year universities and how many credit hours that they're transferring. Our students are performing better as transfer students at the state university as the native students are. We find that, that we provide the support our students need to be successful when they make that transition to the four-year degree. I also wanted to highlight our partnership and, and extreme appreciation to Fort Hayes State University. This fall, Fort Hayes State established a program that any student who graduates with an associate's degree from a Kansas Community College automatically transfers as, as a junior to Fort Hayes. What that means is we don't have Kansas students that are retaking classes or losing credits in transfer. It's important for students and parents from an economic perspective, but it's also important that they get out in four years so that they're not delaying that uh, opportunity to earn income. So we're really appreciative of Fort Hayes doing that program, and we hope that others might follow suit. On the next page um, that has the blue and yellow table, I've indicated what the uh, average tuition and fees are at the Regents institutions, the technical colleges, and the community colleges if a student was taking 15 hours, so that you can see the array of tuitions that we have at our different community colleges. And then on the right, uh, the table shows how much it would cost to complete a four-year bachelor's degree, how much it would complete a cost to complete a technical college associate's degree on average, and, and the average cost it would uh, be to complete a community college associate's degree. You can see that an associate's degree is about $6,800 at a community college, about $10,000 at a tech college, and um, obviously the universities are, are in the four-year degree business. If a student starts with us at the community colleges and gets an associate's degree and then would transfer to a four-year uh, institution, they would save about $10,000. So we're the most affordable option. We allow students to learn close to home and then uh, transfer and hopefully get that four-year degree if that's what they're seeking. We'll talk about our technical ed students here in just a minute. On the next slide, we talk about the number of Pell Grant students we serve. Kansas Community Colleges have the highest Pell Grant serving numbers um, in the system. We had 17,000 students who are on Pell Grant. So generally, if you qualify for a Pell Grant, your family um, generally is not able to contribute a lot to the student's education. And you can see how that varies by institution. So I think our highest Pell Grant serving institution is Independence. They have 34% of their students are receiving a Pell Grant. As you go across the table, there's a column that says percent of total students receiving a full Pell Grant. And again, that's 24% of the students at Independence Community College. That means that their family cannot afford to uh, contribute anything to the cost of their education. So these students are really impoverished, and we have to put a lot of other support services around them. Oftentimes, they're first generation, have other barriers that need to be addressed, including food insecurity and housing insecurity. During the pandemic, most of our community colleges uh, tried to keep the dorms open in some way or another because some of our students literally would have been homeless if we didn't house them in the dorms. 
but that's, that's what we do. You can also see on this table down below the average student loan uh, per institution. The exciting thing for us is that our student loan default rates in Kansas are lower than across the nation, no matter what segment of the higher education system you're talking about. Our universities only have a 4.8% default rate. Our community colleges have a 9.4% student loan default rate, and our technical colleges have a 10.4% student loan default rate. Those are really good numbers compared to national averages. We know our cost of attendance is generally a little lower, but that also shows that our students are dedicated to paying back the loans that they do receive, and that'll be important for their future um, you know, ability to, to get credit, to get a house, or whatever. On the next slide, we talk about high school enrollment um, in the community colleges. So in 2021, Kansas Community Colleges served 21,000 high school students. You can see that the state universities uh, served about 1,600 students and the technical colleges served about 8,200 students. I like to put it in perspective because I don't think that people understand sort of the different segments of populations that the different entities serve. So we serve a lot of high school students. As a proportion um, of our total enrollment, the technical colleges would serve the most. We would be the second, and then the state universities would be third. If you turn on the back of that sheet, which was slide 10, um, but the, it's really hard to see the 10, these are the courses, the top courses that Kansas high school students are taking while they're in high school with the higher education system. So you can see Comp 1 is by far the most, and then 95% of the high school students who are taking Comp 1 in our system are passing. Then college algebra, comp two, public speaking. This is a lot of students, 43,000 students registered in, in higher education courses as high school students across the state. Moving on to the next page, it talks about the success of our students. So it's, it's one thing to have the student be enrolled. It's another thing for the student to be successful. So, um, I've included on this chart the student success rate for Kansas high school students for all the courses and then the courses that are delivered in three different methods. So a concurrent course would be um, the high school teacher delivering that course uh, in the high school setting. Sometimes we send our uh, community college faculty into high schools to do that, but generally that's what concurrent is. So you can see we have uh, about 81% of our concurrent students at the community college are successful. Dual credit students, about 81%, and our technical, our uh, Senate Bill 155, Excel and CTE students, about 72% are considered successful. And then you can see um, the tech college's success rates down below. All of this information is included in the KBOR data book which, and the, the KEED system through the Board of Regents, which is really tremendously helpful. To, sort of, to allow our colleges to compare how we're doing and to focus on improvements. I mentioned in the transfer slide about on-time graduation rates and the, the importance of the Fort Hayes State Initiative allowing our students to transfer as juniors. Community colleges lead the state, graduating 51.8% of our students on time. Students are pursuing an associate's degree uh, in two years. Given the number of part-time students we have, that's pretty remarkable. The next slide talks about the percentage of technical education that are delivered at each of the community colleges. One of the things that is a little bit of a misnomer in this building, when you hear the word technical college, you think that maybe only technical colleges provide technical education, and that's just not the case. Kansas Community Colleges provide 70% of the technical education across the state of Kansas. You can see by institution the percentage of their enrollment that is, is do, doing technical education. So I wanted to make sure that as we think about the needs of our workforce and the very high cost it, that exists to deliver technical training, we're doing 80, about 80% 80 of that work. The next slide is just a little bit about Senate Bill 155. You all know what that is. Call it high school students taking uh, technical education courses for free. The governor does include 2.5 million additional funding in her budget to ensure that that is fully funded. If you look at the bar chart at the bottom of this slide, uh, the yellow bar is how much we were owed, and the blue bar was how much the state paid. Historically, um, it has sort of varied from year to year if the bill we sent was paid in full or not based upon state appropriation. So the good news is 
with the budget this year, the governor's budget, we believe will be fully funded. There was a $1.7 million reappropriation last year. A lot of that had to do with pandemic enrollment declines. On the next slide, I show you the array of technical education that we are delivering in the Kansas Community and Technical College system and the average wages of graduates. You can see um, that healthcare and the healthcare professions are by far the, the area that we are training the most students in. But an associate's degree in healthcare is yielding an average wage of $45,000. That is a hugely um, beneficial to those students so that they can, in two years, come out and be earning $46,000 a year. Also, our associate's degrees in public safety, corrections, firefighting, another really good paying job. And of course, the number one um, occupation of our technical education graduates is electric power linemen. Pratt Community College um, has an associate's degree program. Manhattan Tech has a, a shorter uh, lineman program, both outstanding wages uh, for technical education. Uh, Washburn mentioned their work with the Department of Corrections. Community colleges are partnering with the correctional facility where they are, where they are located all across the state implementing short-term Pell. I don't know if the public safety budget is reported out or not to you all, but there was $6.4 million included in the Department of Corrections budget for equipment that will allow technical training to happen across the entire correction system. They called it Pathways to Success, if you want to jot a note to that. Uh, we are partnering with them. They are, build, they are buying welding simulators and CDL simulators. Our folks will help provide that training. I'm going to skip over the next few charts to save you some time and allow you to do questions. The House was very interested in the number of remedial students we're discussing. Um, if you skip ahead to page 18, this was some testimony that President Flanders had provided to the House uh, committee this summer. According to the funding formula, which does not include all costs that, that colleges incur. Our community colleges spent $8.2 million on remedial education just by what the formula says. I can tell you it is significantly higher than that because of the number of tutors and support services we have to put around students to get them um, up to speed to enter general education classes. However, we are, have done two things to hopefully help things a little bit in this area. One is called um, multiple measures. So previously, you had to have a certain test score or you couldn't enter college algebra. Now we do something we call multiple measures. So it may be a high school GPA. It might be a standardized test uh, score called the Accuplacer. And then it might be an ACT score. We look at all three of those measures and say, does this student really need remedial education? So the numbers of remedial students has gone down somewhat. But the other thing that we're doing is we're teaching courses in a form called co-requisite. So if you need remedial math, you're going to take a five-hour college algebra class instead of a three-hour class. And on Tuesday and Thursday, you're going to come in for an hour of tutoring. So it is an additional cost to the student for those two extra hours. But those three hours that they are able to achieve through college algebra is a tremendous um, benefit for their long-term student success. The next slide on slide 19 is employment by wage and year, the percent of average wages. For our students, you can see that we are increasing average wages, and as we uh, produce more technical graduates, those are generally higher paid jobs. I included something about the Kansas Promise Scholarship Act. It was a game changer. We had to implement, implement it extremely quickly. Senator Baumgartner worked very close with us over the summer. Kansas Community College is awarded 663 Promise Scholarships in just the fall prior to November 20th. Again, these scholarships are targeted to students as a last dollar scholarship that they are going to then live and work in Kansas for two years. That will give the state of Kansas the benefit of the dollars you invest in our training that our workforce, the Kansas companies, will then benefit from those students. And then I just gave you a little bit of a sheet for some more Kansas Promise Scholarship information. I'm going to skip through some of our business partnerships. Y'all can read the testimony at your leisure. Suffice it to say, across our 19 colleges, we have hundreds of business and industry partnerships. I've included um, just some rough financial information. But if you could turn to page 28 at a table that looks like this. This talks about our mill levies. So Kansas Community Colleges are funded. Uh, 
part by mill levy, part by the state, and part by students. The funding formula, which we'll talk about in a minute, um, takes into account this, this uh, investment. And you can see across the 19 schools in the last 22 years, the average mill levy has only increased by four. It varies by each board. Our boards of trustees vote on the mill every, every year and the dollars needed to support our colleges. I'm gonna skip ahead to slide 30 and talk about the budget. The governor's budget includes 24.5 million new dollars for the two-year sector. The first is the 2.5 million for, for Excel and CTE, Senate Bill 155, 6 million for increased in tiered and non-tiered, a million dollars for capital outlay, nine community colleges receive capital outlay funding of the 19, and those are the community colleges that merge with a technical college. And then there was $15 million included for one-time projects. On the next page, which has a table with a lot of red and some black, the community and technical colleges are funded by a formula, and, and it's broken into two parts, tiered and non-tiered. Tiered means technical, non-tiered means general education. For the past decade, there have been schools who have been underfunded and schools have been overfunded. This table shows by institution how that funding looks, and then at the bottom of the table, you'll see total underpayment 5.0 million under the tiered side, about 15.4 million on the non-tiered side. And then you'll see some two overpayment numbers, 7.3 million and 3.1 million. When those two numbers are combined, you get to the table on the back of your testimony. What can, the community colleges would like to request is for you to fully fund the gap. The gap has been as much as 54 million. It's 17 million this year because of the pandemic enrollment declines. So Funding the people who are in black, who have been historically underfunded in both the community and technical colleges, would cost $17.8 million. We would, you could fund this by concurring with the $6 million in the governor's budget for tiered and non-tiered. You could move $11.8 million of the $15 million, or you could, approve, you could uh, appropriate an additional $11.8 million. We don't care about that, which would, which would leave a little bit left in the 15 if you choose to go that route. And we would request that you adjust the number in the proviso that says the people in red for one more year will be held uh, at the same level and will get no new money. And that we would have a work group, a proviso that would add a work group over the summer to come back with a plan next year that we would be put in statute that everyone has had time to agree on, the community colleges, technical colleges, and other interested stakeholders, the Board of Regents, to solve this problem once and for all. This problem has been in existence over a decade. We think that it's time to start uh, next year, is, is time to start this process, but we wanna have some summer interim to think about it and to bring you some legislation next year on paper so that we quit living by the provisos that we've been living with for the past decade. One other thing that I'd just like to mention in closing, the $195 million that's put into the Department of Commerce budget for the universities, we are not allowed to compete for. We have private industry and matching partners. Um, we believe we have $44 million worth of projects that have a 50% industry match ready to go, um, but we're not el eligible to compete for that. We're not asking for a set aside, but we would be like to be able to compete for those Department of Commerce grants if you're gonna fund them. With that, I'm happy to stand for any questions. Questions? Senator Fagg. <clears throat> thank you for, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for your presentation. It was very insightful. The last statement you made there, why are you not able to compete for those grants? I was told it was on purpose and that they didn't think we, we could bring a match, but that's not the case. Any other? Senator Fagg. Uh, as far as kids coming out of high school today with the numbers in here, we're not really prepared for college. Would you say that? Heather? Some of them are not. Is that trend increasing or decreasing? The pandemic has not helped that trend. Uh, learning loss is a real thing, and so we know that we're having to beef up that remedial and support staff and tutoring to make sure that those kids are successful in those college classes. Before the COVID, was that trending up or down? 
I would say if you look at just the numbers, it was trending down a little bit because we were using multiple measures, but it was in practice probably staying about the same because those people were getting in those co-requisite classes. So I would say it's about stable. Thank you, and, and I'm, I'm glad to hear that uh, community colleges are all willing to work to try to fix the uh, shortage on the uh, tiered and non-tiered, so thank you for that. And thank you for being here today, appreciate it. Next, we'll have Matt Lindsay with a private colleges. Matt, welcome committee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I appreciate it. members of the committee. Thanks for your time. I know it's uh, it's already been a long morning, so I will try to be more brief uh, and uh, ask first, uh, again, my name is Matt Lindsay. I'm the president of the Kansas Independent College Association. So I work on behalf of the 20 nonprofit colleges in the state. So you heard Heather a minute ago say you went from one at a time to 19 at a time. Well, I'm here on behalf of 20. Um, you have before you a, uh, a, a, a fact book uh, that we provide that is I've provided to you instead of slides. Uh, it's a kind of teal looking book with a yellow stripe across the front. I'll refer to some of the, some of the pages in there as we go. Uh, so, so, uh, so if you'll have that handy, that'll be good. Uh, I've also sent you a text of things I might say. I'm not going to read my testimony. I'm gonna skip through some of it because, uh, uh, because of time constraints. Um, but I'm also pleased to answer questions now or later uh, if there's things that I've skipped over. Uh, let me talk about the independent colleges for a minute. So the 20 members of the KICA are all regionally accredited by the Higher Learning Commission. They are all not-for-profit, and they all have their main campus, their principal point of operation in Kansas. That includes the state's oldest two colleges, Baker University and Benedictine College, both established before the state was even a state in 1858. Uh, it includes the state's youngest college, uh, Mid-America Nazarene uh, in Olathe, it's established in 1966. It includes the first school in the state to admit women and African Americans, Friends University in Wichita. Uh, it includes the state's first junior college, which is now a four-year school, Central Christian College uh, in McPherson. So there's a lot of history with the, the 20 KICA schools. Uh, and uh, you'll note that of the 20, 19 of them have a Christian faith in their founding. Um, they hold two of those, and that's part of their idea. The 20th is Cleveland University in Kansas City, uh, one of the country's best chiropractic colleges in the country. Uh, so we have, uh, we have a lot of uh, small, vibrant schools with unique missions, 19 of which have a, have a, uh, a Christian faith within their, uh, within their, within their mission. Uh, you'll hear me say uh, a few words interchangeably, uh, nonprofit, not-for-profit, independent, and private. Some of those are or uh, terms of art, so if you'll excuse me, sometimes you'll hear one, and sometimes you'll hear the other. But in my case, all of them are not-for-profit colleges. So we don't have the uh, DeVries and the Phoenixes of the world. Those are for-profit colleges. Uh, the school up the street, Rasmussen, it's a for-profit college. Those are, not, those are not ours. For the 20 KICA independent colleges, we are not governed by the re Board of Regents. We are not coordinated by the Board of Regents. We're not regulated by the Board of Regents. We are outside of their uh, of their portfolio by statute and have been uh, since before there was a Board of Regents. Uh, so that I and KICA stands for independent and that's important. Uh, but of course we do interface with them. We're part of a broader ecosystem of how do we grow Kansas, how do we make sure we are educating Kansas in a way that serves all of Kansas and we're proud to be part of that. Um, let me talk quickly about uh, uh, our enrollment. Um, we are I think the uh, uh, one of the success stories that you can point to in Kansas. So in the last two years, since the pandemic started, uh, our enrollment is up, uh, not down. Uh, so this fall, we had uh, just over 24,300 students across all of our modalities and campuses. Uh, that includes our main campuses, our satellite campuses, those students who are enrolled only online. Uh, we make up collectively about 12% of the college student population in the state. Now, I want to draw you to some, uh, your attention to something on the, uh, on the graph on page three of your book. Uh, while our enrollment, like I said, is up in aggregate, uh, I'm most excited about what you should see in blue there, which is since the pandemic started two years ago, our main campus enrollment, that's the, the bread and butter of KICA institutions, uh, that's up 16% since fall of 2019. So we are growing amid the pandemic. Uh, even our satellite campus enrollment, which hit a, hit a pretty uh, hard, hard stop uh, the first year of the pandemic, has recovered uh, and is up uh, quite a bit. 
uh, as well. Now, I can't offer hard evidence to why this would be the case. I have some hypotheses, some theories. Um, I have some anecdotes. Uh, we think there's probably increasing enrollment on our main campus for a few reasons. Um, one is we were in person throughout the pandemic. Uh, so, of course, in March of 2020, everybody shut down for a bit. But as soon as we, we were allowed to, we were back in person, on the ground, seeing students face to face. Uh, a second is we played our intercollegiate athletics throughout the pandemic on the regular schedule. So our schools, who are primarily not NCAA Division I schools, they're NIIA level schools, played sports the whole time. Uh, also, uh, our, our schools are, of course, smaller, uh, and our missions are such that it very well could have been, and I think is the case, that we created a, uh, some peer accountability that helped us mitigate COVID as we went along, that we, we didn't need heavy-handed approaches to solve this because we, could, we knew to look out for each other. Our value set was such that in a small family environment, we could take care of each other. We could make sure we were taking care of the things we needed to do to protect public health. Uh, and I think a fourth reason is probably somewhat related to um, more of KICA schools are in rural and small communities. And if we have a lot of students coming from somewhere else, it looked through the pandemic that being in those communities was probably safer. Uh, and so we, uh, we probably picked up some students from that uh, respect as well. And I think it's important to go from that to what you see uh, on, on, uh, on page three, which is a large proportion of our growth is attributable to out-of-state students. Uh, we are up nearly 13% in out-of-state enrollment since the beginning of the pandemic. So if you go back to the early state time of the pandemic, California State University system said in, I think, like May of 2020, in the fall, we're not going to be in person. We're going online for the whole semester, maybe the year. We're not going to play sports. Those students are often the same type of students who might say, you know what, I do want to play sports. I do want to be in person. And the KICA schools were, were uh, a good fit. Um, so we know this is a really important fact for us. Uh, about 40, 45% of our students come from out of state across KICA, uh, so a little less than half. And what we do really well is those students stay here when they graduate. When they finish, they've found that Kansas is pretty great. Uh, they find a their first job, they find a spouse, they find a church, they find a home in Kansas, and we keep them here. If you go to a lot of the towns that our KICA schools are located in, you are going to find a ton of people who came there to go to college from somewhere else, from California, Texas, New Jersey, and they stayed there when they graduated. So you go to Sterling, you go to Hillsborough, you go to, uh, you go to, go to Lindsborg, you're going to find a lot of people that that's true for. Uh, we are really good at being a brain gain driver for the state of Kansas. Um, let me uh, skip forward a little bit then on terms of talk about outcomes. Uh, last year, so I mentioned we were about 12% of the enrollment. Last year, we represented 19% of the bachelor's degrees awarded. So we take 12% and turn it into almost 20% of the, the bachelor's degrees awarded each year. We also awarded 20% of the master's degrees. So we award each year about 5,800, 5,900 degrees. Uh, you can see a lot of this on page 12 um, uh, in terms of what it looks like by field. And I think this is an important slide. Uh, there are some fields KICA schools are more heavily enrolled and invested in. For instance, in nursing, our nursing programs awarded almost 40% of all the bachelor's degrees in nursing awarded last year. And that's been pretty consistent year over year. 40% of the new bachelor's degrees in nursing in Kansas are coming from KICA schools. We, awarded, uh, we award about 27% of the bachelor's degrees in law enforcement and emergency management. We are really invested in that work. We awarded all 100% of the clinical counseling and applied mental health bachelor's degrees. We are invested in those sorts of fields. We punch above our weight, uh, if you will, in biological sciences, in math, in, of course, teacher education and computer science relative to our size. Uh, of course, teacher ed has always been a big part of what we do. 19% uh, of the new teachers each year come from our schools. Uh, and in many districts, uh, especially in the center, central part of the state, KICA teacher ed programs form a, uh, a very important pipeline. Um, and I think at the core of this is what we do uh, is our education is about fulfilling a life of purpose. Uh, it, is, it is not purely a get a job, but it's a get a job of meaning. Uh, that's, that's been true through the history of our schools. 
Uh, I know you all know I've been a shameless champion of private colleges uh, up here for many years, uh, and, and I'm a booster and proud to be so. Uh, but beyond all of those numbers of students and degrees awarded, I think we should celebrate uh, how affordable private colleges are in Kansas. Um, let me start by noting how many of our students receive the Pell Grant. Uh, Heather gave you a pretty good primer on, on what that is, and you can see in page six some important data. Uh, nearly 40% of KICA students receive a Pell Grant, meaning they are low-income students. Uh, a quarter of those or so receive that maximum amount. And as you can see, we enroll a, a, a bait about as high a percentage as any of the other sectors in the state. Uh, we are not bastions of the wealthy in private colleges in Kansas. While we have just as many students, we don't sacrifice inequality. Uh, our low-income students, our Pell-eligible students, graduate at nearly as high a rate as the Regents. We swap year to year in terms of the, uh, uh, in terms of the rankings there. And I want to say, in, in, of, of the 53 undergraduate degree granting uh, institutions in, in the state, so the public universities, the community colleges, the technical colleges, and us, uh, there are 53 of them. Only 13 graduate at least half of their Pell-eligible Pell students on time. Of those 13, 11 are KICA institutions. So we really invest in taking care of those students. Uh, and we also manage the cost for everyone. I think a common question is, well, how much does it cost to go to a private college? We've heard it's so expensive. Um, sticker price, so what it's stated to go tuition and fees to go to Kansas is in average $29,113 this year. That marks the 14th consecutive year that Kansas's sticker price has been at least 20% below the national average. KICA is consistently below what you're hearing about private college nationally. But that's just the sticker price. 98% of our undergraduate students receive financial aid, four-fifths of which, 80% of which, comes from privately raised dollars. So after aid, the average cost of a KICA education, uh, including room, board, tuition fees, is just over $16,000 a year. Now that's not cheap. It is certainly competitive uh, and still well below national averages. Uh, and I also want to say, uh, cost per year doesn't quite demonstrate affordability. Uh, in terms of what it, what it, it matters how long you go. And we are really invested in making sure our students, when we say graduate on time, that is a four year on time. That is not taking five years or six years. And it matters because if you only have to pay for four years, in the fifth year you're earning income, you're not only not paying for a fifth year somewhere else, uh, so that's a savings, but you're out earning income and so the, the return there is very high. Um, I'm going to skip forward a little bit and talk about the budget, if you will, for a minute. Um, let me say something I said at the beginning. The only state funds, uh, or I meant to say at the beginning, I'll, I'll, I've, you've heard many times, the only state funds our institutions receive is by the hands of the students. So the Kansas budget, we only get money from the state through the need-based aid and scholarship programs administered by the state. Um, so those students that qualify have to choose to come to a KIC institution to get that money. Uh, that's important for us. So we, 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 we fund our own buildings. We fund our own, our own maintenance on those buildings. We, in fact, bring in outside money from outside the state and spend it here to build new buildings and residence halls and classrooms. Uh, the Kansas student aid programs are the only things where the private colleges touch the budget. Um, and that's all, if you, if you want to get deep in the weeds, that's all listed in the student financial assistance programs, which are in the Board of Regents budget itself, and Shirley has educated you all very well on that, uh, I'm sure. Um, of those programs, the most important for us and the largest is the Kansas Comprehensive Grant. Uh, the KCG uh, is a need-based grant. Uh, it was created in 1999, uh, and it was designed to say any Kansas resident, any Kansas high school graduate who has economic need is going to qualify for this award to go to either a public or private college in Kansas. So let us support Kansans to go to Kansas colleges who have economic need. That includes the Regents, Washburn, and all the private colleges. The total amount appropriated this year uh, for that grant was $24.3 million. Uh, that's about 2% of the total appropriated to all of Kansas higher education in the, in, out of SGF. Of that 2%, about half goes to the private colleges. So private colleges get 1%, or students of private colleges get 1% of the entirety of what you spend on higher ed every year. Remember a minute ago I said we put out 19% of the bachelor's degrees. So for 1% of what you spend, we're giving you 19% of the outcomes. Um, 
in a usual year, the governor's request for the comp grant, uh, and, and it's also true in, the, in fiscal year 23, uh, tends to be about $16.3 million. So we had 24.3 this year because of MOE money that was plugged in, but we'll, let's stick with a standard year, and it's in the governor's budget request at 16.3. Uh, you can see in your book on page 28 how each school in the KICA, how much they get uh, from both this program and the other uh, uh, various uh, aid programs. Um, I submit to you that not only is the comprehensive grant one of the most efficient programs you've got, uh, as I noted, it's also one of the most effective. We know that students at KICA who get it are a 13 percentage points more likely to finish on time than their peers. That's a really effective tool in your toolkit to enhance graduation rates. Um, I want to then touch on then why I'm even in front of you, and that's because in the governor's budget, um, there is, uh, we have some serious concerns, and that's because the governor's budget asks for a new $25 million need-based aid grant called the Kansas Access Partnership Grant. And our concerns are threefold. One is uh, primarily philosophical. Uh, the new grant that the governor has asked for is limited to only students who attend public universities, which would be overturning a 22-year history, history of investing in need-based aid for all Kansas students, regardless of which college they choose. They could choose Baker, they could choose KU. Kansas has a 22-year history of investing in student choice at the higher ed level for need-based aid. This would be overturning that. Uh, that is important because for Kansas, we should be lifting up all Kansans. We do not need a need-based aid program that focuses on sector by sector. We are all in this together. The existing program, so my second objection, is the existing program we have called the Comprehensive Grant I just talked to you about is effective and it's efficient, but it's never been fully funded. The current appropriation, uh, around $16.3 has been enough usually to support about one in two, about half of the students who qualify. Neither Governor Kelly nor her predecessors have ever attempted to fully fund that program uh, sufficient to serve all needs. Uh, yet, the governor's budget for 23 asks for a new program that funds at 25 million, even more than we've ever put into this effective, efficient program that we already have. Um, so the last is, the objection is the newly proposed Access Partnership Grant envisions a one-to-one -one match in a new endowment donations. So even if KICA schools will be added into that new program, which I don't advocate at all creating a new program, again, we have one that works, uh, but if you were to create one, we don't have big endowments. KICA schools have tiny endowments, averages of 16 and a half, 17 million per school, some of them le far less than that. We raise our money in annual fund donations. We are raising money for operations next year. So to force this to be an endowment-based uh, match also would be a way of limiting the ability of KICA students to, uh, to, to, to receive this support. Um, I do think investing in, in, uh, in need-based aid is important. Kansas ranks 45th out of the, country, out of the states in, in terms of aid per student. Uh, we have not done a very good job of keeping pace with need-based aid. Uh, and that's not a red state, blue state conversation. That's not a big state, small state uh, thing. Uh, all of our neighbors have invested quite a bit more in need-based aid. Um, I want to say then in, in conclusion, though, that what we would like to see the committee do is take the access partnership grant, that $25 million, and move some or all of that into the existing effective comprehensive grant program. We want to support students in Kansas to choose Kansas schools that fit their educational needs. Uh, we're happy to be part of that ecosystem. We don't see a, a successful future in Kansas if we were creating sector-limited need-based aid programs. I'm happy to provide specific language to uh, accomplish this to any members of the committee as requested. Uh, I've, I've got in your notes some, uh, some bits about the University Engineering Initiative as well. Uh, you, heard, you all heard me talk about this last year. Uh, we do have the fourth accredited engineering program in the state at Benedictine College uh, and has still not been included in those economic development efforts. Um, to Heather's comment a minute ago, the new grants from the Commerce Department for those kinds of partnerships and matches. Uh, we also were not eligible to apply. Uh, private colleges were also told, no, this is not, this is not for you. Uh, and we would like to see the state work on economic development efforts like this, inclusive of the role we can play. Uh, happy to help uh, craft language to do that. But I want to em emphasize and reiterate, our biggest note on the budget is to fix this issue of creating a new public-only grant and to focus on student choice uh, for all students going to higher ed, support them all, whether they go to a private college or a public university. 
Thank you for the time. I went longer than I meant to. Uh, happy to answer questions. Thank you, Matt. Questions? Senator Alley? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, real quick, approximately how many of the, of the private colleges, their graduates stay in Kansas? I must have missed that. Of the out-of-state students we have, so I'm going to, I, that's what I've been tracking mostly. Of, so about 45% of our students come from out of state and about 40% of those stay. So let's call that approximately, what's 5,000 to 6,000 out of, uh, you know, students a year stay. stay. Okay. Thank you. Other questions? Seeing none, thank you, Matt. Appreciate your uh, presentation today. Next we'll have uh, James Gennad. Technical colleges. Good morning. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Hopefully you can see me too. Uh, say, you saved the best for last, and I'll be very brief. Uh, you have my the testimony from the tech colleges. I'm the president of Manhattan Area Tech College, and I lead the Tech College Presidents Council this year. Let's let's dive into a few key points in the testimony, and not go page by page, but on page two. I would draw your attention first to take a look at the sor primary sources of revenue for the public higher education sectors in the state. And you'll see that the tech colleges uh, are, are pretty lean and mean and trim when it comes to funding. Uh, our total budget from tuition and fees and state appropriations is less than 50 million a year. Uh, universities get 1.2 billion and the community colleges get over half a billion because they have taxing authority for their institutions. When the tech colleges were designed and developed a few years ago, they were not extended taxing authority. In that middle paragraph, a key thing is the economic impact every year of the tech colleges is a value of over 1,600% over what we get in state appropriations. Uh, if you take our total budget again of revenue of about 50 million, according to EMSI, which did an independent economic analysis of each tech college, our combined annual economic value back to the state is almost 400 million. At the bottom of page two, you'll see the breakdown of, again, those primary revenue sources and what it costs to educate a student at the different sectors. And you'll see the community colleges are the best buy in the state. Uh, less than 7,000 per student based off tuition and fee and state appropriations revenues. On page three, we did an analysis of the sectors looking at some key data. And of course, data can come from all sorts of sources and it can be whatever you want it to be. Uh, I, I listed in parentheses with each one the source of the information. I'd like to draw your attention to the graduation rate where the tech colleges lead in the state. Uh, on median earnings for the graduates, we're not far behind the universities. Graduation, the, the number of graduates who remain in Kansas for at least five years, we lead the state with that. We have the least amount of student loans owed after graduation. And 98% of our students are Kansans. Uh, we have very little out-of-state students. What we primarily have for out-of-state is due to regional economies in the Wichita area and in Goodland because of the Eastern Colorado economy affecting Northwest Kansas. For the last five years, the only sector of public higher education in the state that's had consistent growth are the tech colleges. And you'll see that our full-time equivalency has been 8.6% over the last five years and headcount 23%. Our retention rate is almost 70%. So we're very good at what we do. If you go to page five, toward the bottom of that first paragraph, uh, not long ago, Georgetown University has done an analysis of the return of investment of higher education in the nation. They updated the data uh, just a few weeks ago related to low-income students. In the state of Kansas, the top five public colleges and universities to have the best impact for low-income students, KU number one, K-State two, Manhattan Tech three, Washburn Tech four, Wichita State five. University of Kansas, K-State, Manhattan Tech were the only ones in that study that ranked in the top 20% in the nation for career earnings targeting low-income students. 
You see in a couple of the pages, I gave you a list of how we've been using the maintenance of effort funds that were provided by the legislature at the end of the last session, and we thank you a lot. Those were targeted for us to help us with capital outlay projects for equipment. Uh, on page nine, there's a chart to show you, as, as Heather Morgan mentioned, the state funding formula uh, has never been funded and it hasn't been funded in the right proportion. According to the funding formula, the tech colleges are supposed to get two-thirds of our revenue from state appropriations, one-third from the students. For the community colleges, it's a third from the state, a third from county taxes, and a third from student tuition and fees. In my particular case at Manhattan Tech, I get about 30% of my budget, which is about $7 million a year. I get about 30% of that from the state and the rest by my students. So similar to what Heather mentioned, we are urging consideration of fully funding the formula, of providing the new funds for tiered and non-tiered education to go to only those institutions that have had a gap. We're also asking you to consider providing more support for us for capital outlay. In general, the appropriation for the qualifying tech colleges and community colleges for capital outlay has not increased since 1977 which is when the first and best Star Wars movie came out. I get 125000 a year from the state for capital outlay. That's 125,000,000. Um, that doesn't go very far. We would ask consideration that F by FY24, the provisos that are basically hold harmless provisos on the tiered and non-tiered funding go away. Uh, you've got an agency in place with the Kansas Board of Regents that could work on the recentering. They've got the mechanisms in place. We just think, and well, we know from the data, we're the best buy for the buck related to higher ed in the state. We can't do much more. We'd like to do more in performance, but we can't do much more without some more investment. Uh, one of the cool things with the tech colleges not having taxing authority is we can turn on a dime. And we're very responsive to our businesses and industries. Almost every tech college has a unique area of specialization related to their regional economy. For instance, Wichita Tech, Aerospace, Northwest Kansas Tech, Precision Agriculture Technology. Here at Manhattan Tech, we have things related to NBAF and the Animal Health Corridor with Critical Environment Tech and Biotech. And with that, I would be glad to answer any questions. Thank you, James. Questions? No. Senator Fagg. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'm sitting here. What What is the difference between a tech college and and uh, Washburn Tech or WSU Tech? Can you explain that to me a little bit? Well, Wichita Tech and Washburn Tech are part of the Kansas Technical Colleges. They're part of us. There are seven of us in the state. Uh, they Washburn Tech merged with Washburn University some years ago. Wichita Tech has an affiliation with Wichita State. Uh, that goes to show how those universities work with those technical colleges to get even more bang for the buck. The other five of us, Salina Tech, Flint Hills Tech at Emporia, Northwest Tech at Goodland, North Central Tech at Beloit, and ourselves in Manhattan, we are not affiliated with any university. Uh, we try to partner with them where we can. Um, because in the, if you really look under, under the windshield of all of this, the tech colleges provide workforce related to how the universities provide knowledge-based economic development. We, we fill in with providing the workers based on the economic development the universities are doing in their regions. Thank you. Any other questions? Seeing none, thank you for being here today, James. We appreciate your presentation. Thank you. Next, we'll move on to uh, the new president of Kansas State University, President Linton. Welcome to committee. Well, thank you much. Uh, glad to be here today and um, really glad to be in the state of Kansas. I did have a PowerPoint presentation. I didn't know if uh, you should also have a booklet with you that uh, has the PowerPoint slides. I appreciate, appreciate the opportunity, Mr. Chairman and committee to be before you today, uh, I thought I would um, just kind of talk through a little bit um, who I am 
and why I've chosen to come to the state of Kansas uh, for one of the greatest land-grant universities in the country, and then talk about some of the progress relative to research, relative to student success, and talk about some ideation around economic prosperity. So this, uh, this is my fifth land-grant university. Uh, I started as a student at Virginia Tech and then had a, a long career at Purdue University, 16 years, two years as a department head at The Ohio State University, and then the last 10 years as the third largest college of agriculture in the nation at North Carolina State University. The three things that I believe that I bring to the table and the interest that I have in coming to Kansas was I've got a strong foundation in the land-grant mission about what we can do to be able to help the citizens of Kansas, especially around creating new opportunities and enhancing the economy. The second is um, partnership-driven. Uh, whether it's partnerships with industry, partnerships with federal government, with state government, and other universities within the system or other universities outside of the system that help the university go forward and to better the state. This is another attribute that I bring to the table. Perhaps the most important one, which I think is analogous to the opportunity that we have before us this year, is an opportunity to invest in the potential of economic growth and job creation. Uh, most of my career has been working in that area to be able to enhance opportunities and partnerships to be able to significantly grow the economy within the state that, that, that the land-grant university supports. Um, as you all know, we are the land-grant university in the state of Kansas, which means that um, we have the trifold mission of research, teaching, and extension. We are connected in every single county and every single community. And that's the value that I think we bring to the state, to the entire state. We are the people's university. We also reach out to our agriculture and community stakeholders with research and extension centers, not only in all counties, but specific research stations to support agriculture in six different research centers around the state of Kansas. I wanted to talk just a little bit about um, student success because I think some of these numbers would be of interest to you. Um, if you look at uh, one of the most important values with the other chancellors and presidents have talked about is retention. And that's retention from the freshman to sophomore year. We've been growing about 10% over the last several years such that we're now 86% retention rate in keeping these students and having them be successful to a four or five year degree. Also of interest, 97% of our students find employment very soon after graduation. That's one of the highest figures I've seen in the land-grant system nationwide, which means the work that we're doing, we're producing relevant opportunities and relevant degrees where students can find jobs, whether it's in the state of Kansas, whether it's regionally, whether it's nationally, or whether it's globally. I'm also proud to say that over 50% of our students find a way to be able to stay in Kansas and about 75% of our students remain in the general region. We also work hard on two other areas which help support the university, that's philanthropy and also research capacity and research success. From a philanthropic standpoint, we rank about fifth in, in, in the top 5% in the country, and the university raises a little bit over $200 million a year to be able to help in the partnership to be able to help support our university. From a research capacity standpoint, uh, K-State, as you can see with the following figure, has made significant increases over the past decade relative to outside research competitive grantsmanship, uh, growing from 160 million to over 213 million in the last fiscal year. Just talk a little bit about um, our current budget. Uh, this is uh, an outline of our current budget, and as you can see, the top two lines really uh, result from state support, uh, which is state appropriations and student tuition dollars that come back to the university, and all of the other budgetary items are our self-in-house funded uh, financial pieces of the puzzle. As you can see, that state funding in roughly about 20% of a $900 million budget um, supports every facet associated with the university, whether it's academic programs on campus or whether it's research and extension on campus or off campus all over the state through Cooperative Extension, our research stations, and our Olathe and Salina campuses. We are, too, supportive of the governor's budget. We think that the governor's budget this year can be an absolute game changer. 
especially with the proposed investments around economic development and, and economic revitalization. And our university is prepared with significant opportunities to be able to help grow the economy in the state of Kansas. Two other line items that I would like to specifically address. Uh, one is the 5% the cost of living increase in salaries. At Kansas State University, our faculty are 18% uh, below our peers. And one of the most important things for a president, especially a new incoming president, is to be sure that we can retain the very best and that we can continue to recruit the best faculty, most innovative faculty possible. Being 18% less than our peers is going to make it challenging and difficult on the retention side and the recruitment side. So we, it's a very favorable uh, response in the governor's budget relative to this opportunity. The other one has to do with repair and renovation. Uh, we have you know, over $400 million in repair and, re and, and renovation needs at the university and typically receive from the state about $13 million a year. It's, it's like being on a treadmill that's set at nine miles an hour and I'm running two miles an hour. We try to, uh, subs we, we try to partner with research capacity funds and with philanthropy, but that's another very important piece to the puzzle that, again, will help to retain and attract the highest quality faculty possible. I had mentioned we have three campuses, again, the Manhattan campus, the Salina campus, and the Olathe campus, and the burden of responsibility is over 500, bu uh, 500 buildings that represent some $3 billion investment across the entire state. So it's a huge responsibility and a huge accountability. Uh, I had already, already mentioned some of these figures a, a moment ago. And again, uh, we're very supportive of the governor's budget, specifically around repair and renovation, and are working hard to be able to um, find additional support and other ways to be able to help in this effort. We also have a, a, a very important uh, impact on the, on the economy of the state. Certainly being involved and engaged in all 105 counties certainly helps with profitability in businesses around the state through our research effort and through our cooperative extension effort, both on the research side and the outreach, engagement, and education side. There's a lot of great things that are happening uh, at, uh, at the Kansas State University campus. Uh, we are building out a, uh, what's called the North Edge Collaboration Campus, which is all about stimulating opportunities for recruitment of industry to be able to work in a private-public partnership opportunity, which would engage in uh, interdisciplinary an inner exchange of research, as well as providing an opportunity to give the student experience, the student experience of the future needs that would be as associated with job opportunities in the state of Kansas. With an opportunity with NBAF being uh, recently constructed on our campus, the BRI and the already very strong uh, agricultural and animal and human health industry that we support, uh, we'd like to leverage all of these opportunities to be able to be what we believe we can be best in the world when it comes to animal agriculture uh, in, um, at Kansas State. We've also been working hard on an economic prosperity plan, which is, again, working towards some of the things that I've just discussed in the last couple of minutes relative to um, our North Campus um, co collaboration to be able to stimulate opportunities for recruitment of new industries to the state. When you take a look at our economic prosperity plan, at least at, at the moment, the original estimate is that in a 10-year period, we'll create significant opportunities in job creation for the state, over 3,000 jobs, and a $3 billion return of investment to the state of Kansas. So that's all I've got for the first three days on the job. <laughs> Um, there's, there's a whole lot more ideas that I have about the future of, of Kansas State University, but um, I'm incredibly proud to be here and want to do everything that I can to aggressively move our university and the state of Kansas forward. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation today, uh, uh, President Linton, and uh, welcome you and your family. Uh, I think you'll be a great fit at Kansas State and look forward to working with you. Are there questions? I don't think we have any. So you, you did a really good job. Thank you. Um, uh, Mr. Um, Chairman, can I ask a question? Sorry. Yes, go ahead, Tom. Uh, thank you. Great to have you here, President Linton. 
and uh, excited about what you picked up in only two or three short days. Uh, I'm personally, uh, the chair mentioned on one of the other presentations that the three business guys that are sitting up there in front of you, I'm kind of a 50-50. I'm a public education servant, both in higher ed and K-12, but I also had a business and and uh, I'm particularly uh, supportive of the economic prosperity plan that you rolled out with the regents and several legislators uh, in December. And I think there's, uh, when we look at the jobs and the investment and the structure we already have in place to build on, I think uh, there are some really good things that can happen in Kansas. So I hope we can find some good ways to support that. And I know there are several things you'll be looking at, and I'll be eager to hear about some of those in the future and maybe even yet in this budget year. So welcome. Thank you very much, and thank you for your support. In case you uh, haven't have not had an opportunity, uh, Senator Hawk lives in Manhattan, so yeah. <laughs> I'm sure you'll you'll get a meeting soon. Yeah, I've had and a chance. So. Oh yeah, okay, okay. Good. Yeah. okay. Well, if there's no other questions, uh, thank you uh, again for being here, and thank you for being patient. We ran over a little as we do occasionally, so thank you all. Appreciate it, committee. Uh, if there's any, no other business, any questions, we we'll, we are adjourned.